I am joined now by Politico national reporter Gabriel De Benedetti in Arlington, Virginia. Trump's main campaign promise is that he will build a wall. It's the one thing he has stuck firmly to. He's referred to Mexicans as rapists and criminals. So what does he get out of going to take this meeting today? Well, there are two possibilities for him here. He could either go into this meeting and try and look presidential, try and have a very nice, polite meeting and come out of it saying, look, I can deal with foreign dignitaries. I am rising to that level. The other possibility is that he has a big confrontation with Peña Nieto and basically says, look, I'm standing up for the United States, as I've always said I would. Uh, and, you know, he walks out of it basically with a lot of bluster. So either way, if it's one of those two options, he thinks he could walk away with it uh, looking good. President Peña Nieto, on the flip side, has compared Trump to Hitler and Mussolini. So what does it do for him? He already has incredibly low uh, ratings right now in his own country. That's exactly right. He is uh, in extreme political trouble in his own country. The last numbers I saw showed that less than a quarter of the country was approving of the job that he was doing uh, as president. But he's dealing with a lot of scandals of his own, a lot of negative headlines. What he's going to be looking for is a confrontation or at least some sort of news that distracts the Mexican public from a lot of negative news that they've been hearing about him. So, you know, one of the few people who is less popular than Peña Nieto himself, Donald Trump. It seems like they're both looking for the same thing, and you don't expect that they can both get what they want. It's a private meeting. Both can come out and say whatever they wish actually happened. Do we think we're really going to know what goes on behind those closed doors? It's extremely unlikely that we're going to know exactly what happened, but I would be surprised if we didn't have leaks of some sort. As you said, both sides will be looking to spin this hard in their own direction. And Donald Trump is going to go and give a big immigration speech tonight in Phoenix. So what we're likely going to see is him setting himself up for tonight's speech. He's going to be trying to take all the headlines here and, you know, he's going to be trying to dominate the American news. Benya Nieto is going to be trying to dominate the Mexican news. There is a possibility that they can both try to spin this separately. You mentioned the speech tonight, and we've talked about it for over a week now. It feels like there was the softening of Trump on immigration and then the report that, no, he is standing firm with his original beliefs. What do we expect to hear in his speech tonight in regards to any specifics on his immigration policy? It's a great question, and unfortunately, the answer is we don't know what to expect at this point. Obviously, the reality is that Donald Trump used illegal immigration, as he framed it, uh, as you know, one of the reasons for running this this campaign and one of the animating principles that he would follow is cracking down on uh, on on the illegal immigration that he talks about. He's been saying this from day one, so to see him suddenly reverse would be a big surprise. What we might see is some more specifics on his proposals, but I wouldn't count on it exactly because we haven't gotten a total preview of what he's going to say. That softening stance seems to have been, at least some of the rhetoric has been, that it's not just really to reach out to Hispanic voters, that in reality it's the independents, the, the women who want to see that softer stance. Do we expect maybe some more of the same so that it, it can court that vote, but is, isn't that dangerous also to his base? Absolutely. You know, this is, a, this is a, a tight line that he has to walk. What you're seeing, what that dynamic is, is very similar to the one that he was playing with over the last few weeks when he was basically making a direct appeal to African-American voters. Now, his numbers are so low among African-American voters that even if he started to win 2% more, wouldn't really make a big difference electorally. But what many people read that as was a direct appeal to middle class white women voters, people who are very often Republicans, but who don't want to vote for someone who's widely perceived to be a racist. So he's out there and saying pretty explicitly, I'm not a racist. I'm appealing to these uh, to these specific populations that you're asking me about. While Trump remains in the headlines, Hillary Clinton could be there as well. The FBI will soon release notes from its investigation into her email servers, could be as early as today. The State Department says mm -hmm. the FBI has recovered about 30 documents related to the Benghazi attacks. What are the implications for her as these new documents come out? You know, unless there is one more, uh, or unless there is one smoking gun, what we're likely to continue to see is a continued drag on Hillary Clinton's trustworthy numbers or favorability numbers. But what the campaign is counting on at this point is that well, you know, the American public has heard all this before. This is an issue that they've been dealing with since before she launched her campaign. Obviously, these are new developments and potentially could be some very interesting ones. But what the Democrats are hoping at this point is that there's no one, you know, bright red flag email and that, for the most part, this is just a headline that the vast majority of voters have already made up their mind on. Yeah, you mentioned the unfavorability, both uh, at, at all-time lows right now for two candidates. Mm -hmm. 
and you wrote an article, it was interesting, about the strategy that the Clinton campaign has right now in dragging the Trump campaign, sort of forcing them to campaign in states that are traditionally Republican, like a Georgia, like an Arizona. What's the long-term advantage to something like this? The idea there is that they're trying to get Donald Trump to stretch his resources because they're thinking every single dollar that he spends in Georgia, which Republicans should win, is a dollar that he's not spending in Ohio and Florida. So as long as they can get him to stretch his resources and as long as they can, as they like to say it, trick him into going to Georgia, into Arizona, maybe even Utah, he's not spending that time or that money in Florida and Ohio. And the long-term reality is that Democrats think they have a chance to compete nationally and on the state level moving forward past this election cycle in states like Georgia and Arizona. If they can make them competitive now, it's a long-term investment. Gabe, could this backfire, though, on them? Oh, absolutely. There's the reality that Donald Trump could call their bluff and just, you know, force them out into the wind in these states. The, the, the truth of the matter is that it's not that risky for them because they do have quite a lead in a lot of the, uh, a lot of the swing states that they're going to need to take in order to win uh, 270 electoral votes come November. But, but it's also a risky play. They could be seen to be going overconfident, and that's something that they definitely don't want to do. 69 days till the election. Cave DiBenedetti, thank you. Thank you.